Hey guys, uh, it's Mr. B here. So we're going to get started with our first lecture, and this is a review of the understanding chemistry section that we did before we started our PMA preparation. Um, as I said earlier, it's been so long since we've seen this stuff, I figured a good refresher would be a um, decent idea. And um, we'll do an assignment uh, regarding this tomorrow, and then we'll move on to our brand new unit. So without further ado, let's go ahead and um, review what elements and molecules were. So we'll start with elements. And uh, if you have an element, you have a substance that's made up of atoms that are all alike or all the same. Um, you know, as I've said many times in class when we were studying a certain table, um, how do we know if we have something that is an element? Okay, if we know its name, how do we know it's an element? Well, fortunately, we have a list of all known elements. And that list is known as the Periodic Table of Elements, also known as Mendeleev's Periodic Table of Elements, named after the Russian chemist who devised the idea. Uh, it's been refined since um, his idea, but he gets credit for the majority of it. Okay, you can see in the picture right here, um, we talked in class about how this is organized. If you want, uh, if you guys give me some feedback in our Thursday live lesson, we can review that as well. So, um, but I'm going to take it for granted in the meantime that you guys have a pretty decent understanding of the periodic table and what the things on there mean. If you don't, again, please let me know because it is really, really fundamental to our next unit. Okay, so going on, um, elements and molecules, uh, we have uh, compounds. And that is when two or more elements combine. Um, also, the thing you have to remember about compounds is that the elements are combined in a fixed proportion. If you look at water, the chemical formula for water is H2O. You always have two atoms of hydrogen for every atom of oxygen. If you had a different proportion, H2O2, for example, you don't have water anymore. You have something else. Oh, by the way, don't drink that. It's not good. Okay, molecule, it should be noted, is neutral. Okay, it forms when atoms share electrons, and the sum of the two protons in the two atoms is equal to the sum of the electrons in the two atoms. Okay, if you remember, the electrons carry a charge of negative one. Protons carry a charge of plus one. So if the number is equal, they cancel each other out. Your molecule or your atom is neutral. Okay, uh, another point of note, every compound is a molecule, but not every molecule is a compound. What do I mean by that? Okay, so if you look at water, uh, you look at the picture down here, um, you can see the two atoms of hydrogen bonded to the one of oxygen. We have different elements bonded and they're sharing electrons and um, this is a compound. What's the difference here where we have molecular oxygen or O2? Okay, O2 is um, still an element. It's not a compound because we have two of the same atoms that are bonded to one another. O2 is the um, predominant form of oxygen found in the atmosphere. We also have O3, by the way. Some of you may know that already. Um, but oxygen is, uh, I wouldn't say unique, because many other elements have this ability to bond to themselves. But not every element can do that. We'll talk a little bit about more about bonding as we go along in this, uh, um, in this review. Okay, but um, one of the things I want you to have as a takeaway from this lesson is an understanding of chemical formulas. Okay, so remember that all substances are made up of molecules and or atoms. And um, a molecule is simply a group of one or more atoms. So why do we need chemical formulas? What possible use do they have? Well, that just simply tells us, number one, how many atoms of each element are in a particular molecule, or how many molecules we're dealing with in the first place. Okay, so chemical formulas can be pretty useful when it comes to uh, determining whether things can bond, whether two elements can bond, whether two molecules can bond. 
Um, and we'll talk, again talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Okay, if you'll remember from our um, lesson when we talked about the periodic table, every element on the periodic table has what we call a chemical symbol. And each chemical symbol consists of one or two letters. Okay, the first, uh, the first letter in the chemical symbol is always a capital. So uh, something to take away from that. Uh, gold, for example, is chemical symbol is AU. Notice at the bottom here, the A is capitalized, the U is lowercase, and you'll see that is pretty much a convention for every element on the periodic table that has a two-letter designation. If, um, if it's represented by one letter, like for example, hydrogen is just represented by an H, that is always capital. You'll see how useful that is in just a second. Okay, let's look at the chemical formula for table salt. That is NaCl. Uh, um, table salt, better known as, anybody remember? That's right, sodium chloride. Okay, and um, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this formula and determine how many different elements are present. And to do that, all we have to do is count the number of capital letters in its chemical formula. You'll notice here that the N is capitalized, the A isn't. Over here, the C is capitalized, but the L isn't. So you have N and C, two capital letters. There are two elements in sodium chloride. Okay, moving on. So what do we do? Now, when we took a look at sodium chloride, we were fortunate. There's typically, in fact, there's always only one atom of sodium and one atom of chlorine. So it was kind of neat for us to look at that one. But what if it's not quite as neat? What if we have multiple atoms, same type, in a particular molecule? An example of that would be the water pictured here. We have, in fact, two atoms of hydrogen, one of oxygen. So therefore, we can't say it's HO, because that would imply that there's only one atom of each element. So we have to use a 2. Now over here, it's a large 2. Typically, this 2 is subscript, and that denotes how many atoms of that element are in that molecule. So we can see that there are two elements here, but there are, in fact, three atoms. There are two atoms of hydrogen, one of oxygen. Okay, and once again, remember that uh, with chemical compounds, this is important because if that proportion was different, you no longer have water. I'll remind you of the joke we told in class where um, two guys go into a restaurant, one asks for a glass of H2O, and he's given it, he drinks it, and the other guy asks for H2O too. And he's given what he asked for, and he promptly collapses. Yeah, don't drink H2O2. It is not good. Okay, so moving on to chemical formulas, um, looking at the actual numbers now. Um, you'll often see numbers before the letters. And what that refers to is uh, how many molecules are involved. So if you look at this right here, you see we have two hydrogen atoms, or two molecules of hydrogen, excuse me. Whereas if you look at the oxygen, we have molecular oxygen here, O2, but only one molecule of molecular oxygen. Okay, you can tell how many atoms are in the molecule. If you look at uh, our molecular hydrogen here, if you take the two in front, and you multiply it by the two that should be in subscript, you get four. That tells you there are four atoms of hydrogen here that we're dealing with. Whereas, if you look at the oxygen, there's nothing in front of the O, so we assume there's a one. By the way, if there's nothing after the chemical symbol, we assume that's a one as well. But in this case, we have a two. So we have a one assumed here times two. That tells us we're dealing with two atoms of oxygen. And when we put it together, 
We get water, H2O, but we get two molecules of the water. Okay, um, I'm hoping everybody understands there. Please remember, guys, I know I'm going through a lot of information, and I'm going through this pretty quickly. Um, remember that we have our live lesson on Thursday, and that's going to be largely directed by you and your questions, okay? I'm not going to have much in the way of an agenda. Ah, let's see, we're being joined by one of my furry, furry friends here. Hey, say hi to my class. Okay, she's not in a talkative mood right now. But uh, anyway, I kind of lost track of where I was there. Oh, yeah. So please remember, if you have questions, if you have concerns about this material, write it down, type it in your, uh, in your laptop so that you have it available so you don't forget it, because that is <clears throat> excuse me, largely what our live lesson is for. I'm not going to have much in the way of a formal lesson plan. It really is at that moment to give you feedback on the work you have. Okay. Um, by the way, for both our live lessons and our recorded lessons, your parents are more than welcome to join in. Um, and I'll talk more about that in another video. Okay, so let's go on here. Okay, and uh, so we talked about chemical formulas. We're going to talk about types of bonding. When we have a molecule, we assume that there has been some sort of chemical bond. Not all chemical bonds are the same. Okay, now the beginning of understanding types of bonding starts with that humble electron, remember, of the three subatomic particles that we talked about, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Electrons are by far the smallest, but they play the largest role when it comes to bonding. Okay, remember the, some of the things we talked about, like um, if the number of protons and the number of electrons are equal, we have a neutral atom, meaning it has no charge. Each electron has a charge of negative one. Each proton has a charge of plus one. If they're equal, once again, they cancel out, you have a neutral atom. If they're not equal, if that atom gains or loses an electron, which happens quite often, what we have is an atom that now has a charge. If it gains an electron or electrons, it, it gets a net negative charge. If it loses an electron, now the protons outnumber the electrons, we have a positively charged electron. In either case, we no longer have a simple atom. What we have now is something called an ion. And uh, you're going to hear that word again when we talk about our second type of bonding. Okay, so the electrons, as I said, played a crucial role. Um, the biggest role that they're going to play are the, well, the electrons that play the biggest roles are the ones that are found in the outermost shell or en energy level of an atom. Those are called valence electrons, and that outermost shell is called a valence shell. Okay, um, I know we talked about this in class, but this is probably a little bit harder than the material we've done, so it doesn't hurt to repeat, and um, it's been a while since you've heard it. So um, this brings the question, well, why do atoms bond in the first place? Well, the thing is, they want to be stable. They want to achieve that stability that can only be achieved by completely filling that outermost electron shell. Okay, so the first way they can do that is to find another atom and form what we call a covalent bond. In a covalent bond, electrons are shared between those two atoms. So they can get closer or achieve that goal of fulfilling that outermost shell. Now you'll remember um, how, many, how many electrons it takes to completely fill that shell. The first shell only requires two, the second shell eight, and the third shell 18. Okay. Um, note about covalent bonds. Covalent bonds are the strongest of all the chemical bonds. Now if you look at the example we have here, we have CH4. Four, four atoms of hydrogen bonded with one of carbon. By the way, does anybody know what the name of this chemical compound is called, CH4? I'll give you a second to think about it. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's methane. All right. Okay. Molecular compounds 
are defined as compounds where atoms share electrons through covalent bonds. So whenever you have a covalent bond, you have a molecular compound. Um, another name for it is a covalent compound. And um, once again, uh, this is a, a lot of uh, repetition, but again, this is some of the harder material to kind of get a grasp of. So um, anyway, when these bonds occur, the uh, molecule enables the atoms to have a more stable configuration. And we're going to talk about ionic bonding next. So remember I said that sometimes atoms don't share electrons, they gain or lose electrons. Okay, and we'll discuss in a second when atoms will gain or lose versus when they share. But um, if you look here, NaCl, if you'll remember from earlier in our discussion, NaCl is the chemical formula for salt. And this is an example when they bond of an ionic bond, okay? So it's very, it's much easier for a sodium atom to lose an electron than to gain seven of them. Whereas it's much easier for a chlorine atom to simply take one electron from another atom than to lose seven of them so that it has a completely filled outer shell. So what happens with sodium and chlorine is that the sodium atom will give its one valence electron to the chlorine. Now sodium's happy, chlorine's happy, but remember what we said happens when an electron is gained or lost? Both of those elements now, or both of those atoms now have charges, they're ions. The sodium ion now has a net positive charge. The chlorine atom now has a net negative charge. Well, if you'll remember from magnetism, when two things have opposite charges, what happens? That's right, they're attracted to one another. And that attraction results in a bond known as an ionic bond, and you end up with sodium chloride or humble table salt. You'll remember from the video we watched just how reactive sodium all by itself is, where when it was thrown in water, what happened? It went boom. But when it's, a, when it's already bonded, it's already reacted, and uh, so you don't get that violent reaction that you did when it was all, than when it was all by itself. Okay, so we have other types of bonding, guys. We're not going to go into detail on these because uh, this is simply just not at our level yet. But uh, other types of bonding include polar bonds and hydrogen bonds. I did include a link that has a description of both of them if you're interested in reading, but this is not something you need to know at this level. Okay. Um, a rule of thumb that you can follow is the octet rule. And um, what it's basically saying is that elements tend to bond in a way that each atom has eight valence electrons. What it's trying to do really is mimic or imitate the nearest noble gas to it. Because if you'll remember from our study, every noble gas is extremely stable because they're always, um, they always have their outermost shell or their valence shell completely filled to the maximum. Okay, so what it's really trying to do is behave like a noble gas. Um, but the, like, for the octet rule, remember octo is a prefix that usually has a connotation that means eight. Okay, so every electron, or sorry, every atom is trying to get to that point where it has eight valence electrons. Okay, so some uh, noteworthy um, things here. Covalent bonds can only happen between nonmetals. So if you look at the periodic table and you see that the two elements that you're looking at are both nonmetals and they've bonded, you can pretty much bet your bottom dollar that a covalent bond has occurred. If one of those is a metal and the other is a nonmetal, typically what you've had was a it was an ionic bond. And um, we're not going to go too, uh, into too much detail on this, but metals can also bond with other metals. And that is called, yeah, this is really imaginative, but they call it a metallic bond. Okay, we're going to keep the conversation to covalent and ionic bonds for the moment. Okay. Um, moving forward. 
we have reached the end, and um, I hope that you guys have uh, found uh, something useful in here. I hope most of this was just a refresher. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please um, write them down, jot them down. O outside of our um, regular classes on Thursday, our online classes on Thursday, and our recorded lectures, remember, you can reach me via email anytime, and I'll respond to you as quickly as I can. If it's in regular school hours, typically I'll respond to you within minutes when possible. Um, if it's after school hours, typically I'll get back to you the next day. But uh, that's it for now, guys. Um, that was it for today. Tomorrow we'll do an exercise about what we just learned. And then on Wednesday we're going to move on to our new unit. So uh, if you have any questions, please send them to me or see me in the live session on Thursday. And we'll talk then. Thanks so much, guys. Stay safe.